Hello, welcome to the strategy stream. Um, my name is Ian Hendry, and I will be your MC for the first two segments um, here this morning. Uh, so we've got three speakers coming on in our first stream. Uh, later on, we've got Dean Baker and Shane Lee from PEXA, um, as well as Sanka Abasinya uh, from WSO2. However, first up today, we have Emmeline Wang, and Emmeline is a global lead of DevOps at uh, AWS Marketplace at Amazon. And Emmeline is going to be talking about uh, going to market with APIs, which is bound to be a really um, uh, interesting topic around how we actually uh, make APIs more easily discoverable and marketable um, and, and in improve their adoption. So looking forward to seeing uh, how we go. And I'll hand over now to Emmeline Wang. Welcome. Well Awesome, Ian. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let me walk over to my presentation so I can start. So hi, everyone. My name is Emmeline Wong, and I work at AWS, as Ian mentioned. Um, it was not long ago that I was very likely in your shoes at a company that builds software to manage APIs, integrations, and the next product platform and its associated APIs. Currently, I oversee full lifecycle API management, integration, and low-code independent software vendors who sell their software products and services through the AWS Marketplace. I am incredibly grateful to Saul and the local API Days Australia organizers for being such great hosts to the global API community. Today, I kick off the strategy streams with the session about what it means to go to market with APIs and why APIs are key for a smooth, long-term go-to-market. Now, I really enjoyed Mike's keynote presentation. And if you notice, even without coordination, a lot of what I'll be talking about is definitely related to what Mike was saying in his, in his keynote. So I love that there are those um, threads of um, similarity where um, you'll be able to get a lot out of this particular conference. So first I'm going to cover five assumptions that you can use in your organization to help you assess whether or not API strategy is a first class citizen. So when an API strategy is a first class citizen, that's when you know, things are going very smoothly and you're able to achieve better customer results faster. And there's basically a lot less friction. So these five assumptions have both up and downstream effects. So I'll be sharing real world examples of what happens from a human psychology standpoint when you hold these views and you know, choose not to keep API strategy as a first class citizen and just as an afterthought. So in the first two assumptions, I have worked at software companies and enterprises and organizations um, across the board. And here's you know, some of what I've heard as well as from um, consulting clients uh, when I was an independent API strategist. So assumption one, I can just skip the public APIs, like you know, creating them, publishing them, since developers aren't using my product yet. Assumption number two, my private APIs are just good enough for internal use since the end users have a software UI. So what happens when we think in this way? With the first assumption, here are three up and downstream type of symptoms, right? That kind of help you as you sort of score whether or not you're treating your API strategy as a first class citizen. If you're skipping thinking about public APIs, here's kind of what happens. So say you get to a point where the community and your customers and your partners, they really want to be able to use part of your data or functionality in their products or platforms. Say you want to expose it using a developer portal or even a service catalog. What happens is if you were only focusing on internal APIs, now you basically have to comb through the backlog and understand all of the dependencies that you'll need to, to deal with. The other thing that's really tricky is if you've got an internal product backlog that basically competes against your public API, then that's another piece that's, that's very difficult to balance. 
Finally, retrofitting security is incredibly painful, right? Whereas if you design with security in mind, even when the API is a private or an internal API, then it's a lot easier to expose the external or public version of the API when you're security minded in your design. And then you'll also get the effects of the fact that business development partnerships and being able to create customizations for um, you know, your ecosystem, what happens is you basically lose speed because those public APIs don't exist yet. And you know, having them rise to the top as a priority is very difficult. Also, you have the case right back in 2013 where we saw that a development community may just try to build an unofficial or non-sanctioned API since the official ones aren't yet available. And what happens then is the, the actual organization will have to decide, okay, well, you know, how do we gracefully kind of balance the fact that we want to publish official APIs um, and, and you know, kind of work with the development community to take down those non-sanctioned non APIs. And then the other case is you'll have a successful company that has built their own business model on the fact that they're writing scripts and scraping interfaces and grabbing data, right, from either publicly available or um, sources where, again, it's not the official API. For the second assumption, my private APIs are good enough for internal use since end users have a UI. So here, what happens here is if you have an internal team that's using your API to create custom integrations because your customers, right, they rely on you to do those, then what happens is now that customer is integrated with your API. And if that API is updated, then the internal team needs to know. And because the customer is, is integrating and using the private APIs in production, right, that traffic is easily found. And so it's really no longer truly an internal API. The other piece that's really interesting as a downstream effect is that unanticipated end users, what happens is if, um, you know, the private APIs are just being used inside, then externally, say you have some customers with very sophisticated analytics, you know, they want on-demand real-time reporting and capabilities that are very um, systematic and programmable. Um, when you don't have a public API, then it's very difficult um, for them to be able to achieve the jobs to be done. Um, finally, if you just have a UI, think about how many portals you have to log into today, right? Anytime you have context switching, um, you know, that reduces productivity. Assumption number three, end users interact with my product via the UI. So I don't need to spend time on API design. So you can see these assumptions are very different, but in a very granular way. And here's what happens when a company thinks this way or an organization thinks this way. What happens is from an integration standpoint, um, if there isn't intelligence in your integration platform, then what happens is uh, an architect or the organization has to really understand the two or the you know, multiple different APIs that, um, that you're integrating with to where you have to map the data fields. And that often takes quite a long time to learn um, a new API, especially if they're from you know, companies that have very different business models, right? So think about the fact that you might have you know, Workday, HubSpot, Marketo, Salesforce, you know, these kind of connectors that we typically see in integration platforms. And also you have different styles of APIs and it's very difficult to, to basically um, you know, integrate quickly. Um, the other piece that's very interesting is just because there isn't a cost to access the API, Right, so say that it's not a direct monetization model. Um, the interesting piece about that is if you're actually integrating with that supposed right free API, how critical is that free API to your actual core business model as well as your business performance? Is if that API is down, how is it going to affect you and your customers? And then the other piece that 
that's um, that I'm not, definitely not doing it justice is basically architectural mismatch, right? So what happens today is we need to find ways to repair, detect, and avoid interface mismatch. So when I mentioned this, it's basically talking about the components where um, in context, right, whether it's runtime or uh, rather whether it's during the integration, what happens is um, contextually the APIs don't match, right, even if they if you compile the code and it runs. Assumption four, integration with the API is too difficult and the automation value is tough to capture. So what I mean is say you have a very influential leader, right? To where they have to decide whether to use precious development and engineering resources on the product itself or to be able to do a third party integration or to expose APIs for the greater ecosystem. And you're competing with different priorities, right? Scope, ROI, um, and key performance indicators. And basically what you're trying to do is you have a job to be done, you want a quick fix. And so you think, oh, right, let's just try to, let's just try to um, avoid doing that. And so what happens is now from a human perspective, you're really missing out on automation that removes undifferentiated heavy lifting so repetitive tasks, and you miss out on the very strategic ways that you could be able to get, um, you know, get there faster. So, so all the concepts that Mike covered in his keynote, right? Who is going to get there faster? Because all of that technology exists, um, but it's you know, getting there first is the first mover advantage is, is just as important as network effects. Um, finally, new motions of doing business mean that as an organization, you need to adjust the human psychology, right, to find new ways um, for product adoption and to reach your end customer base as we all get more sophisticated. And if you don't have the automation that you need to scale everything, um, then you won't be able to build that sort of flywheel effect. So we're almost done with the assumptions. So creating an API is very difficult and expensive to maintain. Let's just do it later and work around it using what I call duct tape, right? So things like spreadsheets, emails, anything that's untrackable, auditable, you know, maybe it's just on your desktop, right? To say, oh, well, I really wanna get something done quickly. So what happens there is organizations continue to become more siloed and it's very difficult. You know that piece of information exists, but you don't know where to find it. The other issue is leaders really find it hard, right, if they're a really data-driven organization to be able to capture, right, the value that the team is delivering. Um, and, and when you have that delay, then it's tougher to kind of communicate that internally as well as, um, you know, get, get uh, the kind of thought process that you need to build what you need, um, you know, and expose it to the outside world. And so um, this particular assumption is also very detrimental because um, most companies have retention policies, right? All software and hardware has kind of an end of life. And the other issue is it's not just about, you know, tools that you can use. It's within an organization to reduce any sort of shadow IT or to mitigate it altogether. You kind of want to, to lock things down um, to more secure ways of, um, of collaborating. So how can you solve, you know, using reuse and scale, you know, being able to build and test it and run it everywhere? So I'm going to tell you a story from the early part of my career. Um, I was uh, in grad school and I was very grateful that um, I was studying technical communication uh, while I was also working as a tech writer. And so what's really interesting, uh, and especially paying homage to the fact that we do have a chip shortage in the world right now, is the fact that um, one piece of silicon, right, that's designed and produced and created physically, and, and remind you, this is, you know, back um, in the early 2000s, what happened was that same piece of silicon, you could market it different ways to create de design wins in an OEM. So for example, this one piece of silicon, depending on how you write about its capabilities, right, for reuse and scale, 
the same chip could be used in a NASA spaceship, in a car, um, in a phone, in a computer, in a smart home, but it was just one piece of silicon. And so to me, you know, that's, that's really interesting because really it's all about the context that you're working in. So I created a construct um, that's a little bit different, right, than, than the dots and um, the loom that Mike talked about in the keynote. But basically, it's a, it's a very high level of abstraction of what I call the code spectrum. And as mentioned, I'm working with full API lifecycle management, iPaaS, as well as low and no code ISVs. And the reason why that's important is if you think about integration platform as a service, it typically contains API management, integration, right, which includes data integration, API integration, application integration. And then usually there's components of low and no code capability where you can drag and drop to be able to, you know, abstract yourself from the code. But say you do need to access the IDE environment within the low code environment to troubleshoot, um, you can, right, in certain circumstances where you need to. So the reason why I created the code spectrum is because currently we're in a state where earlier I talked about how we've got interface mismatch. So you might have right an Alexa device or a phone or Slack or a web browser or you know 10 different portals where you need to log in just to be able to talk to someone and then there's multi-factor authentication. And there's so many different interfaces that just physically don't talk to each other and then digitally also don't talk to each other. And so the reason I mentioned that is I created the framework of the code spectrum to help um, companies sort of solve a couple of questions. So I'll give you an example. So low and no code, the value uh, I think isn't really in the fact that there's a user interface that abstracts you from the code. I think the, the real value of low and no code is the fact that uh, you can have more accessibility and people contribute to an application or build a new application from scratch without affecting the, you know, the back end architecture and creating more technical debt. And so the reason why that's incredibly important is um, so initially when serverless was launched, you know, many people were asking, well, could DevOps practices still apply to, to serverless? And the answer is yes. And so, you know, this code spectrum, you know, basically helps you to, to focus more on what you're trying to solve and how much code you need to be able to access. And I'll show you a real example to, to better illustrate what I mean. So we're going to play kind of a quick, fun, local game. I'll give you two slides of clues and you can kind of put in the chat if you know the answer. Can you guess which Australian ISV? was founded in 2013, is based in Sydney, has 55 monthly, uh, sorry, 55 million monthly active global users across 190 countries in 100 languages. Um, this year in April of 2021, it was valued at as $15 billion, uh, that's uh, US dollars. The next clue is that they do have an API and a developer portal so that um, the community can create smart integrations and powerful apps. They're, they have multiple databases that run upwards of three terabytes of data. And to the point in the keynote, this particular ISV is aiming to be available to the three billion internet users in the world with an eye on accessibility to every culture. And they're uh, being used very prevalently in um, Brazil and Indonesia, for example, where there's quite a bit of population and emerging cultures. So I was gonna give you a few minutes to see if you could guess who it is. If you guessed Canva, you're correct. A hundred plus designs are created per second. And to date, users have created over 5 billion designs. And it's just such an amazing example of a company that you know, whether you're non-technical and you want to create designs or you're a developer and you want to be able to make designing available in what you're trying to build for a more customized experience, you can do that. So let's go back to this code spectrum framework to kind of see what I was talking about. So 
Um, you can see that uh, Canva offers context editing and publishing capabilities, right, in the form of extensions. They have something called design with Canva button. Um, and then they also have kind of print partnerships. So say you've created a digital book and you want to be able to work with third party companies to, to make it physically available. So here are some of the key takeaways of what we covered in this section about go to market with APIs. You've learned five ways, right? Uh, probably the tone is a little bit cynical, but I wanted to be very real, right? Because in this day and age, API strategy, it's very difficult, right? To, to kind of push up to be a first class citizen, you know, like it is at a company um, that's cloud first and all in on AWS like Capital One. And so making a first class citizen uh, you know, of an API strategy means that there's both up and downstream effects that you definitely have to make your company aware of and carefully, you know, look at each of those effects to basically prevent them and, um, you know, just prevent pain right down the line. And the reason why you want to do that in a positive, right, non-cynical way is that you tend to delight your customers, your employees, um, your partners, and that piece is really important because whenever you have a delightful experience, you tend to remember it really well, even though, you know, a, a negative experience tends to stick with you kind of deeper. Um, but if you can delight someone, um, you know, it, it's really key uh, for retention. Um, I provided a real life example of an ISV with a very successful platform like Canva um, that also has a UI that's accessible and um, developers can also use it. And so there's, you know, they'll continue to march towards uh, adoption, right, of 3 billion users. Um, and then I also introduced the framework of a code spectrum and why it's key to explaining that low and no code interfaces still mean that you want to start from the beginning and design your API properly. And um, here, you know, at, at, uh, at Amazon, we basically have a concept called one or two way decisions. And um, it's very interesting to see, you know, your thoughts of whether or not you think um, APIs are a one or two way decision, right? Meaning, is it reversible or is it something that you can continue to try and iterate on? And so the reason I introduced this sort of framework is, um, you know, the six most successful business outcomes are really going to include automation capability and faster integrations that are only possible um, through APIs, as well as um, detecting uh, and fixing that sort of interface mismatch that I talked about. And then finally, um, I would like to dedicate this talk to you know, all of the consulting partners and independent software vendors um, that make my uh, role at AWS Marketplace amazing. Um, there are 50 other, you know, category leads like me um, that manage, you know, across different categories um, as well as industry verticals. And so if you, you know, like to understand how you can be, um, you know, either purchase more products and services um, on Marketplace or if you'd like to become a seller, um, I would love it if, um, if you would connect with me during the conference to have uh, a chat. And then I just wanted to highlight a few of, you know, the folks that I um, have had the pleasure of talking to that um, that are part of AWS Marketplace today. And, you know, they're here at the conference as well as sponsors. So definitely reach out to them. Um, I recommend that that you find their product listings um, on AWS Marketplace and take a look. Um, some of them have free trials or you can click to subscribe to see them on your AWS bill. Um, if you're an organization or in, you're in procurement, then you may want to contact them directly to uh, do what we call a private offer. Um, and then another type of prof private offer that's available is also with system integrators and global system integrators. And so um, I wanna make sure that I do your, your questions justice. So feel free to you know, send them to the organizers or um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And I'll stay in the platform to address questions directly, um, uh, kind of in the chat to you. And I just really appreciate everyone and hope you have a great conference and enjoy a WSO2's talk next.
Hi there, Ian. And this is where I realized I was on mute. Um, that's all very good. The, um, so we won't do an interactive Q&A, as uh, Emmeline said, um, but have you got a minute or two and we can just have a, a quick uh, conversation around, um, in particular, how you, you address businesses in terms of making the business case to establish the, uh, a marketplace and to start putting in these kinds of um, capabilities that you talked about, um, especially for organizations who might be a bit more project centric in the way they approach their funding. Um, because this kind of can be a strategic capability that needs to be nurtured and led over time over different programs of work and just any insights you might have as to how you approach that. Absolutely. So Abus Marketplace is a global team and so the reason I mentioned that is um, it reaches people both in a self-service way and there's also the very high touch strategic way. And so the reason I mentioned that is, um, right, there's over 10,000 listings on AWS Marketplace and, you know, there's thousands of, you know, ISVs and consulting partners, right, as I mentioned before. And so what we basically tell a, a new Marketplace seller is you know focus on exactly you know what it is as a company that you're trying to achieve and then basically you can use aws marketplace as your go-to market vehicle hmm. and so the reason i mentioned that is every aws customer right anyone who has an aws account can click to subscribe right so there's kind of almost no barrier of entry there However, for a consulting partner or an ISV to be able to offer products and services, it does require an API integration. Um, you know, it's very simple. It, you know, at, at, at the time of writing currently, it takes, you know, about two days, depending on the type of, um, you know, listing. Um, however, uh, the way that you would justify or kind of prioritize that product to the front is to work with kind of like a head of, of sales because Marketplace also uses that high touch sales motion that I touched on earlier, right? Where we talked about private offers and it's basically um, taking, so your, you know, I, as an ISV, your field sales just negotiate, negotiates a deal as they normally would. And they basically put the terms of those deals on the back end of the product listing in this, you know, it's software, basically it's the AWS Marketplace Management Portal and the customer you know accepts that um private offer and what happens is you know they were probably going to purchase your your product anyway right or maybe they're just now discovering your product and they don't just want right you know someone maybe a company has thousands of employees just to click to subscribe what they want is for the organization to have governance and to reduce risk in a way to reach right sanctioned software within the company and so meaning it really depends on the, you know, the ISV's particular strategy, what they're trying to achieve, right? Is it $10 million gross software sales, um, you know, annual revenue recognition every year, right? So it, it just depends on what that ISV is trying to do. And they yeah. can basically be as hands-on as they want, right? If they want to be very self-service, they can do that, right? Say it's a, it's a developer that wants to, um, you know, create, a listing they can but say it's a you know a massive enterprise and they want to be a part of a marketplace they can as well yeah so it's all about scale thanks for asking no worries thank you very much uh Eminem. uh like i said any questions you you might have um feel free to put them in the chat now uh we can take them offline and uh Emeline can uh, reach out to you Emeline, sorry can reach out to you uh directly um outside of the uh chat here thank you thank uh, you so much